Okay, a lot of the diagrams you're going to see um, are uh, 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 reachable on the internet, and they're done by uh, Mr. Chris Cotis, and they are phenomenal bits of work where he has reconstructed what has happened to the planet over the last two billion years. I strongly recommend that you look that name up on the internet and have a look at what he's done. Nothing that we can talk about today in terms of a comprehensive view of the island can be talked about without discussing Hans Kugler, who by many is considered to be the pioneer of geology of Trinidad. The map that I'll be using was compiled by him, it was work done by a number of geologists. What's particularly spectacular about what he did is that he got everybody from that to work together. With none of us have worked together since in geology. <laughs> That's a fact. Uh, there's a guy called Jim Pindell who's worked a lot on trying to reconstruct what's happened to Trinidad and northern South America. And I've plagiarized from his papers without compunction. I would argue that he's plagiarized from some of mine without compunction, but he may not agree. Barry Cobrown needs special mention because Barry encouraged me to be inquisitive about the geology of the island when I was a not yet graduated in the subject. Gene Raw, who was a boss of mine with whom I spent many hours running around the field while the company was paying, thank God. Um, Bob Ehrlich, another, another colleague with whom I spent many hours and most of the good photographs in this presentation will come from him. Stephen Dallacosta, whose photographs I've plagiarized. Hazy, sorry, that's Hazy Vincent, um, who, whose photographs I've used. And I've got to thank all the other geologists that I've ever known because they've always encouraged me to get out of the field and do some, do some field work and, and enjoy the geology of the island. Okay, next. Okay, let's talk about some of the principles of geology, okay? Geological time is long. Very, very long. Um, the world as we know it today, our Earth, our planet, is thought to be about 4.6 billion years old. Too many noughts to actually even put on a piece of paper to be meaningful. But what I've tried to do is to show you on this scale, which is a clock, that Trinidad's time, in terms of the planet, starts at about 11 o'clock. So 90%, 90 plus percent of time is not represented in Trinidad at all. So by any standard of anybody's imagination, Trinidad is young. Okay? Now, you may argue with me that 190 million years can't be young. That's the paradox that I'm trying to explain. The oldest rocks in Trinidad are 150, 180 million years old. But in terms of our planet, that is but a pick in its entire history. Okay? So I've got some few other scales up there to give you a feel for what's going, what was going on on our planet. When the oldest rocks in Trinidad were being deposited, dinosaurs were nearly facing extinction. Mammals had come into play, and various other things had happened which had massive effects on, on the planet, including a couple of snowballs when the entire planet was covered in ice, but we have no record of that here. So we're going to focus just on this little hour last hour in a 12 hour day um, that, that is represented in time by Trinidad. Okay, and most of what covers Trinidad is what would not be seen within the, 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 the clock hand, okay, of time. Um, Trinidad, a lot of Trinidad is exceptionally young. Okay, so this is the map by Scotese. I uh, hope you recognize oh, in the modern world the planet, the, 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 major, um, um, the major continents, North America, South America, Africa, and, U, and, and, and Eurasia. We are where the little rod, red dot is. Here's the Caribbean island arc, and here's the isthmus of um, Panama, and Costa Rica, and all those lovely places. On this map, you'll see that in the ocean there are various ridges and various topographic uh, highlights to show you that. When you leave the planets, you go into the deep oceans, there is a topographic change. This has huge significance in understanding how the planet works. Okay? 
Um, I am going to show Trinidad as being two colors, okay? The scale is much bigger than Trinidad because I needed you to be able to see the colors. Trinidad would be a pinhead on this diagram. Um, because Trinidad is about a journey. Trinidad is, from where it is, we're going to take a journey and two bits of Trinidad are going to travel in different directions over time. And I'm going to illustrate that by moving these two halves over time to where they would have been in diff at different times in our history. Next. Well, first, be before, we need, before we can go down that journey, we kind of need to understand a little bit about why parts of Trinidad can travel on a journey. And that journey is best explained by understanding a theory, which is now virtually a fact, and that theory is called plate tectonics. It means that, the, that our planet is covered by little bits that have the ability to move around and have moved around through time. I am old enough that when I was studying plate tectonics at university, I was only allowed to describe it as a hypothesis. Okay, so in my lifetime, I was lucky enough to go from having something that was a hypothesis to now being recognized as an everyday fact when it comes to geology. That doesn't happen often in geology, because it just hasn't. So it's an extremely fortunate time to be studying geology, because you can come up with all these crazy ideas, and you could call things whatever you wanted, and they could move all over the place, and people have had lots of fun writing about how all these things have happened. So, if we take our little dot, and we look at the earthquake distribution across our planet, again, you'll recognize the continents, I hope, you'll see that the earthquakes are kind of focused on specific lines. Okay? And it just so happens that those are the boundaries of the moving plates. And because the boundaries of the plates are moving, they break the rock and they cause the earthquakes that we can measure. Our little Trinidad, which you can see as a little outline here, which I've shown in the orange part and the purple part, like I described before, happens to be on one of these major bands that runs across the, across the planet. But if you take a close-up view, you can see that this band is not really a straight line, but it's really quite a diffuse distribution of earthquakes that occur all around Trinidad. Okay? That means that everything around Trinidad is moving. What's interesting is that as you go further inland into northern South America, you can see that they've become a lot more focused. Okay? So we're going to try and describe what that means later on in the talk, but what you have to get into your head is that Trinidad's on the move. Okay? And it's on the move because it's on a plate boundary. Next slide, please. Sorry, this is not very clear at all. I'm sorry I didn't project well. Um, but we are on the Caribbean plate. This orange line, no, it's not. It's, not, it's just the quality of the diagram thing. We're on the, this orange line that is on the edge of one of these plates that we call plates and plate tectonics. And that orange line describes the outline of that plate. And we are at a junction where this bit of the plate turns into that bit of the plate. Okay? And it's called the Caribbean plate. And it is on the move. Modern GPS, which is another huge advance that has been made in understanding the current motion of the bits on our planet, is accurate enough that it can measure movements of millimeters per year. Millimeters is the speed at which your fingernails grow, okay? GPS is accurate enough now that I can tell the difference between a GPS station here and one in Siberia and the one in Sipari is moving at a couple of millimeters a year less than this one here. That's the accuracy with which we have been Okay, so we actually can measure what's happening. That's the first time, that's in the last 10 years. So when we talk about, next slide, when we talk about this Caribbean plate, we can actually put vectors or di directions in which things are moving. So this is the Pacific plate here, which I'll probably enlarge too, hard, too big. It's moving in this direction. The car Let me just say, sorry. Assuming that South America is fixed, it's our reference point. This is moving this way. The Caribbean plate is moving that way. 
And the other side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which Africa is on, is moving away from us as well. So compared to South America, everything seems to be moving around it. This bit's going under it. This bit's going across it. That bit's going away from it. And Trinidad is where this is going to be moving across from South America. So these two blobs are going to move in different directions at different times throughout history. To understand a little bit more about basic plate tectonics, I want to just show you a diagram of what it would look like if you cut a slice through the Earth where that yellow dot is. So this bit of the ocean here is actually diving under. You have to imagine this is moving this way. It's diving under, because this is actually moving this way, under this bit of our planet. And that's melting and causing the volcanic island arc that we know as the Antilles. Okay? So a bit of our planet is diving underneath another bit of our planet. As it goes down and it gets hot, it melts, and up come the volcanoes. <coughs> the volcanoes that we're familiar with that are active, for example, Montserrat, the Sufrias in Guadeloupe, and, in, and, uh, and, and uh, St. Lucia, and Pele and Martin, which killed 20-something thousand people at the beginning of the century. These are real active and they form the island arc. Trinidad is not there. Trinidad is somewhere else. It's in a complicated zone. But because Trinidad is going to move through time, at certain times it's going to be in places that look a bit like the coast off, say, Brazil. It doesn't really matter where you are. Where you have the continent here, you've got this flat area in front of it, or seaward of it, a slope and then you go into the deep basin. So we call that the coast, the continental shelf, the continental slope and rise, and then the ocean bottom. And that's what that profile would look like if you went along the equator through that orange dot. Okay? So those are the, are the places, the settings, that are quite different on our planet that Trinidad has been occupied through time. So I just wanted to give you a few examples. Trinidad's not been occupied that one, sorry. It's been occupied this one. Let's keep going. So actual motions in Trinidad, these are GPS stations that have been posted by scientists who have been measuring the actual movement on a yearly basis of different parts of Trinidad relative to South America. So this dot here is fixed, imagine. Okay, South America is a fixed point. This is all relative to South America. And you can see that they have measured these arrows, show the direction in which bits of Trinidad are moving. And the length of the arrow shows the magnitude, the amount of movement. Okay? So here you can see quite clearly that most of the northern range is moving pretty close to dead east. And the arrows are bigger than the arrows anywhere else. Now if you're moving faster than everywhere else, you're leaving them behind and the relative movement is as if your legs would be splitting apart through time. If you could put your legs in Ciparia or in Arena, they would be moving this would be moving twice as fast as anything down here. So Trinidad is actually moving relative to itself. Within Trinidad there are movements, and within Trinidad you have earthquakes as a consequence. But if you take two centimeters, two centimeters of movement per 10 years, and you multiply it by 25 million, which is a small amount in the 150 million that things have moved, Things are going to move a long, long way. You're talking about 250 kilometers in 25 million years for the movement of Trinidad, and so forth and so on. So if we go all the way back to 150 million years ago, you're talking about a thousand kilometers of movement, just because of the relative speed of some bits to the others. Okay? So we are geologists are trying to understand where the northern range was 150 million years ago compared to where the southern parts of Trinidad were 150 million years ago. And that's a little journey I'm going to take you through now. Okay? We're going to go through step by step through time. We're going to take giant leaps. Okay? Bear with me. But in time, but they're just a couple of hundred kilometers of movement through time because things are moving relatively, relatively slowly. But still, if you've got enough time, that relative slow takes you a long, long way. And we're going to put Trinidad in the Pacific when we finished parts of Trinidad in the Pacific when we finished our journey. I think that's pretty impressive, and I think it's pretty impressive that we can figure that out in only my lifetime of study. 
because there was no concept of this, I have to tell you, before I was at university, before I went to university. So it, I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty crazy. Let's go. So here's Trinidad again, here's the equator. Okay, we're going to take some references, and what we know is that um, these things are moving relative to each other. So what we're going to do is to take these things and, and move them back by the amount that they should have moved if we can understand how much they've moved relative to each other. It gets a little complicated as you go back in time because things don't keep moving at the same speed. It's not far in our retrogressive history, or in our, whatever it was, back, back a few million years, when the speed changed from 10, 20, which is 20 millimeters a year, which is two centimeters, which is what Trinidad's moving relative to South America by, but it was seven. So things accelerate and slow down through time. So our job is to try and understand when those acceleration and decelerations occur so we can put position parts of Trinidad in the right place at the right time. So let's go back in time and take a step back. Let's go back one year time right And let's look at only 14 million years before present. That's what that means. NYBP. From a KU botanical point of view, major shift that occurred in terms of the way we view things today, and that is that there was no Isthmus of Panama. The oceanic fauna had nothing to block the Atlantic and the Pacific fauna was mixed. Okay? So that was a vast, that made an incredible difference to both circulation in the oceans and to the fauna that existed in the Pacific and in the Caribbean area. But, as you can see from my diagram, I've taken an, an, a piece of Trinidad and I've moved it west by about 200 kilometers, say about where Margarita is now. You can see that Florida was not a happening place, it was underwater, so was Cuba. And our island Park was actually a long way further to the the island arc that is the islands that we know today is actually a long way further to the west than it is now. I can't show you that relatively on this diagram. Other than now, this on the modern diagram is out here somewhere. Okay? So some part of Trinidad was out here 12, uh, 14 million years ago. So Florida's missing, Cuba's not there, um, no Panama Canal, and uh, as we go back in time, we'll see next slide. We'll take another jump now. We're going to go to about 50 million years ago. Okay? Trinidad, the distance between these two is supposed to be about double. There really isn't an island arc at all. Okay? Trinidad sitting off Colombia ish today, from a geopolitical point of view. And it's sitting on a continental shelf. The southern half of Trinidad is sitting on a continental shelf, and the north continental shelf, and in this sort of setting, and the, north, the, and the other bit is sitting, also sitting in that sort of setting. Fed here, no rivers, but here fed by a massive river, which was being fed by the development of the Andes that had started to come up at about that time. Excuse me, was it above water at that time? No, all of Trinidad was in this sort of setting. Ah, so on, on, all, on, all of the water. Okay, okay I'm, I'll go into that a bit and explain what rocks are related to that. But generally speaking, we're all in this continental, um, the ocean bottom, <coughs> continental rise, continental shelf setting in both the south and the north. <coughs> so there's no need to that. Not that. Not that I can detect, no, I would say it's all underwater. In fact, a long way underwater, I mean deep underwater. I mean like 2,000 feet down close to it. In the south, there may be hints, it was a little bit shallow, but that's more like here. Yeah. But the north was definitely down here, and most of the northern half of the south of Trinidad was in that sort of environment. Okay. So let's go back now, we're going to take another jump, we jump now from, we went from 14 to 50, now we're back at 90. 90 is an interesting time, it's a Cretaceous, we're all, we're all familiar with dinosaurs running around the place. But what I want to show you is, is that Trinidad now is occupying a virtually equatorial or a southern equatorial position. The northern, the, the other half of Trinidad, the total half of Trinidad has taken off and gone heck and beyond wherever. There's no island arc anymore, that hasn't even been, that hasn't even been thought about existing. And I'd like to emphasize the proximity of Africa. Okay? So Trinidad had just split away from Africa not long ago in this plate tectonic reconstruction. 
at that time, sea level was very, very high. You know all these people who panic about sea level rising? But in terms of our planet, we've seen that none has been there, and in fact, we flooded the whole of the inland USA, we flooded all of the Aini Andes here, and Trinidad was definitely underwater. I mean, it's a good time to be submerged. Plenty submergence. Okay, look at Florida, not there. Most of the Yucatan is underwater. Most of the planet's underwater. I mean, the, 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 the sea levels rose so much in that period that the Cretaceous ends up being the most prolific oil producing time because most of the continents became flooded, and that's when the rocks that make oil were deposited. That's just a, a coincidence, okay? So remember, our little island has gone on quite a journey now. Now we're talking in terms of hundreds, if not a thousand kilometers of, of movement of the rocks that we see today juxtaposed against each other. Okay? And again, the setting is this sort of setting. Okay? In both environments. In both settings. There's a, there was a huge, I told you there was a huge river coming through here. Now that river has been flooded in, and it's become uh, a seaway. Next. Okay, so this is kind of almost the beginning of time for Trinidad. But again, the two bits have the two bits have split apart. But now the southern half of Trinidad was probably on land and joined Africa. Okay. <coughs> this is not split apart yet. There's only one Atlantic Ocean. That's the North Atlantic Ocean, and uh, the Andes haven't formed properly yet. There's some Proto-Andes. This stuff has only just begun. And the world is very different then. The northern half could have still been in, a, in an ocean, but the southern half was probably on, on, on the continental shelf or emergent. Let's go one more. And I just want to show you, here's Trinidad now, going back a little bit earlier, about 100 and, I don't know, about 195 million years, and all the continents are locked together. So it's really difficult to tell where Trinidad was, the southern half of part of Africa, South America, and North America, and I suspect that the northern half of the island was somewhere up in what was the Proto-Pacific. We called it Tethys at that time just because there was only one big ocean and one big landmass. So, excuse me, did the Caribbean plate exist then? No, no, the Caribbean plate is going to occur when this, these two start to split apart. So it wasn't in existence in the original no, no, so keep going. Go, go the other way around. Just go backwards a bit so we can see this evolving through time. So here's it splitting, which gives the Caribbean plate a chance to come in. And I'm going to show you. Let's keep going back in time, right? It's coming this way, yeah. So here's the 90. There is no real Caribbean plate. It's part of the Atlantic, but this is starting. You see this thing? It's starting to come through the gap. And that's going to bring the Caribbean plate with it. Keep going, right? Let's come closer. So here you see it. You see it? That little frontal thing has pushed its way through the gap to give us our Caribbean plate. Okay? So the Caribbean plate is, some people believe, a little piece of this that's actually squeezed through the gap and made it into what was the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic has been submerged underneath it along this ridge, which actually in this particular case turns out to be the Alvarez Ridge, which is an old island, not the one we know today. But that doesn't matter. The importance is, is that yes, it's come through here, and it did not exist at that time. So let's 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 get let's go back to the Jurassic. Okay. So no, there was no Caribbean plate at that time. Well, yes, there was a Caribbean. If you believe it was part of the Pacific, it was somewhere out here, and it's yet to push its way through. Okay. So let's keep going. So that's a very poor um, map of Trinidad, but it shows the major points. And just looking at that map, you can quickly see that there's a dramatic difference that occurs along a line that runs east-west across Trinidad, which is the El Pilar Fault. And it's very conveniently um, identified as potentially the place where the two bits of the island went on their different journeys. This bit traveling a long way to the west through time, and this bit staying relatively stationary. Okay. So if there's a long travel bit of Trinidad, it's our beautiful Northern Range. Alright? This stuff I think has traveled. 
but it's traveling a lot less and a lot more slowly. Because there isn't one line that joins the two. There is in Venezuela, but when you get to Trinidad, the movement is more diffuse. We saw movement across the entire island. So little bits of traveling are traveling in this direction relative to South America. But this piece and the offshore north of here and Tobago have come a long way. Okay, next. So what are those rocks? What is the evidence? Remember we said that this was off the continental shelf in a continental slope back in the Cretaceous and the Jurassic and even the Eocene, which is 50 million years ago. What's the evidence? Well, if you are brave enough these days to go to a place called Lamantil and you start looking at the rocks that that era has given us, that high sea level that we talked about in the Cretaceous, remember it flooded everything, it led to prolific growth of reefs. Okay? The reefs had these huge continental shells to grow on, and they grew in profusion. All over the world at that period of time you had reefs. And if you go through Lavantil, you will see this is sink bands, which is a particularly frightening area to be in. Uh, I, the slide didn't come up very well, but I tried to show that within this stuff you can see bivalves, rudists, gastropods, and all sorts of things. And they're absolutely exquisite rocks. Um, fortunately for us, they gave us the rocks that built some of our prettiest buildings in Port of Spain. When you see that chunky blue stone that, is, that was quarry, no longer quarry, it was quarry from Picton Quarry, where a young George is smoking a cigarette, was um, taking a photo, got, got Bob early to take a photo of him. Because these were the sites where those nice chunky rocks could be extracted and put into buildings all over Port of Spain. And I still think they are most beautiful buildings. The shame of it is that we can't quarry them anymore and we now have to deal with um, you know, regular gravel. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Where are these buildings you talk about? I've got one like Sacred Park or the police station on Edward Street. And if you look in the gutters in some parts of Port of Spain, they still preserve that beautiful polished near marble. And if you look in those carefully, you will see all of these little fossils hanging around in them. You look like a crazy person and they might take it to St. Anne's before you really identify it. Which is why you don't see John just doing it often. But we, we, go to, we go to dangerous places like St. Bath's to do it instead. Okay? Um, so, so, you know, this whole band of, of, of greenish rock on this diagram, including um, the island of uh, Gaspari and uh, this is Point Gold, Huevos all fall along this line, which is the El Pilar Fall, and are all limestones. Limestones because they're built of reef detritus. So the reefs grew on the shelf margins, and they were thrown into the deep ocean, the debris from them. And that's what you see in all of these situations, as you, if you have the opportunity to see them. So I, 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 I recommend taking a peep at them whenever you can. In other places, you also see some interesting rocks. This is called the Cherry Cake and Laurent which you find near Togo. And again, we know that this is debris that fell off the, a continent and poured into a deep ocean and settled as little pebbles in that deep ocean. At, at Togo, here, the yellow dot, you have um, beautiful Galera bricks. If ever you walk there, it's a beautiful white sand that's everywhere. Again, those sands were brought in by rivers and redeposited deep in the oceans. And they kind of look like this if you look at them. And the net result of all that is because of that setting for most of the northern range. There were lots of different rocks that were dumped off the continent into this deep ocean. And when you walk our streams of Trinidad, you'll just pick up any rock and they all look so different. I mean, they all look so different. That's because the garbage, the, the garbage truck just came to the edge of the continental shelf and dumped everything off. And the net consequence is that our streams are full of very colorful rocks. And the limestone ridges, these things, these bands, whenever they occurred, whenever they reefs threw things into the deep water, they got quite hard, and they're quite often the sills that make our waterfalls, or our gorges in the northern river. So we have to thank them for that. And they are you, the limestones, those limestones, are the bluish bits that form the core of the central range and give us the caves of a repo and all those lovely sites that we enjoy so much. So we do have to thank Cretaceous reefs and little corals and things, for all of these things happening way up near the Pacific, we're not nowhere near where we are now, okay, so we've got to take them back miles and miles 
But that's what contributes to that particular um, that, that particular assembly, which I think is largely responsible for the nuclear one or more than Next. Okay, so we've given up on the on the front top half. We're going to look just at the bottom half now. We're going to try and look at some of the rocks and things that happened there to show you that they're a little bit they're quite different. Um, but not that different because the settings were not always that dissimilar. So let's have a look at this bit of the island in some detail next. Okay, so we're going to look just across what we call the central range, right? Which starts in, uh, which starts where? It starts Claxton Bay, between Claxton Bay and San Fernando, uh, Mayo Quarry, um, Kamana, um, Mount Harris, uh, Brigham Hill. Um, the red dot is a photograph taken from Brigham Hill. And again, um, these rocks are only 14 million years old. So we've gone from 90 to 14. But they too are limestones. But instead of being that bluish color that we get in the northern range, they are bright orange or yellow. And we quite, you know, we quite often see those along a lot of our crops along the central range. Sometimes within them, they're full of pebbles. Um, this is a simple red pot of the scale, by the way. You can see the big head, so be careful about the background. Much smaller than it is. Um, in that setting, so this, this was on a sort of a continental margin setting, but not far away you had deep water settings where the sandstones of Mount Harris were being deposited again shed by rivers and thrown off the continental shelf into deep water. From an economic point of view at the same, these, these, are, these are Cretaceous rocks from that earlier period but on the south side, these are the Naparima Hill rocks and they are the, the rocks from which all the oil in Trinidad is derived. That's a point bubble about the birth by the way. Um, but so Naparima Hill is about 90 million years old. It pops up here and that's how we have a window on what the conditions might have been like at that time on the southern half of the two blocks moving past each other. So quite a diverse assemblage of rocks um, occur across here, but, we, but generally speaking, I mean, you, if you contrast what Naparima Hill looks like with what we saw in the Northern Range, was, so they're not very similar rocks at all, and that's because they were set in very different places, though the location on the continental shelf is not that different. Thanks. Okay, and then we go to the south of Trinidad, and I'm taking a sort of a transect down the east coast to give you a feel for what's going on. And here, all of a sudden, the rocks are very different. We've got these sandstones of, of, of different, of young age. These rocks are only about two million years old, and they occur in bright yellow bands all over the place. Some places they have coal, and some places they're gray shales, and this is a radix point, just to give you an example of those rock types. So something very different starts to happen in the quite recent time here, and we are going to have a look at what that might have been. Next. What we think happened is that the Orinoco, our, our friend who lives just south of us right here, actually extended at about two to three million years ago all the way out here. Okay? And when it came, it deposited back on, right? In the back one. Most of the rocks that you see in blue, oranges, and yellows dotted throughout the southern, southern part of Trinidad. So the Orinoco came and washed across the whole of Trinidad and deposited all of these sands and muds and um, things that grew in swamps. These are these coals are definitely swamp coals and muds um, that, that, that came with them. Next right? And next. And that's where we produce the oil from. Okay, so those sands that were deposited by the Orinoco only about three million years ago. So within the time frame of the 12 o'clock period have deposited the, the, these reservoirs from which we have discovered oil in this particular case in Guayamiari and this particular case forest reserve. Further out on the continental shelf, the rocks are even younger, and those produce the gas, which are powering Point Lisas and the energy that we're burning in this room right now. Next. So, 
that's a brief summary of the different rock types that you've got and what, why they are, how they are. But let's go back to the journey that Trinidad took. So we, re we, we recognize today that if you assume that Venezuela, that South America is not moving, the south half of Trinidad is moving east, but not quite as fast as the north half of Trinidad. And that journey, that movement, is causing the rocks to get stressed and bent, and um, generally when they're very unhappy, they create earthquakes. Let's have a look at some of the results of that journey over a thousand kilometers to see what that's done to the rocks. Okay. So, if you look at the geological map of Trinidad, you'll see that there are a number of lineaments that I'm sure that the, you know, the, the eye can quite clearly pick out. And there's this very strong northeast fabric. And it occurs somewhat in the northern range as well, but it's most pronounced when you hit the central range and southern Trinidad. Okay? There is another fabric which goes this way. It's got slightly different orientations. You can see it cross-cutting the northern range. It's what gives you the Grand Rivier Sans Souci um, uh, valleys, which are uh, very pronounced drainages. It gives you um, Filet Point or What's the other name up here? Um, uh, Chupara, thank you. And you can see that the Chupara point follows it, follow that line down. You see it takes a big nick here. And that's why all of the Glacier Shirts region is so different from the western end of the peninsula. You follow that nick point, you lose the limestones that you see, this band, which is the Laventine Hills and all that stuff. It, it actually has a pronouncement even in central Trinidad. You see this blue band gets bent up like this. And that's the Mahaika High. There's a little gas field there. That's why the savannas are in this area, because it's an actively rising piece of Trinidad. Um, and as you come further south, you can see it relates back to the rocks that are exposed in this area, and so forth and so on. So these trends are very important, and they're, they're, they're significant. What we have to do is try and understand why they're there. Next. So, what do some of these trends look like? Well, this one is quite famous. I don't know how many of you, well, it's not, maybe not famous to be known by all of you, but this is the Los Barros Fault. It's one of the younger faults on the island, and I was fortunate enough to be able to go to a site that Petra Trinidad cleared, put a housing on. And they left it abandoned, as many Petra Trinidad projects end up being, for a while. And the Los Barros Fault eroded itself out in this beautiful linear you could follow across the park, the lot, straight across the, the, the major development site. It's quite an interesting experiment because they've since, since done everything you shouldn't do and they've built houses right on top of this thing. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to visiting in the future to see how many bathrooms are moving compared to the main. You know, they were told you're getting our three bathroom. Well, I think you're going to be our three bathrooms for the guest room rather than our three bathrooms for the main room. There is no, no doubt that this thing was actually moving when I saw it. This, this I understand one of the buildings has been demolished already. Oh, is that right? Please hear that. But just as a fascinating anecdote, it's not just Petrochim that does it, Atlantic Energy has actually put their plant right here. <laughs> on reclaimed sand. Just, you know, perfect for earthquakes. They've done nothing better than a bucket of sand to shape. But I'm not going to say anything. Maybe it's never going to, there's never going to be an earthquake. Okay? Is there anywhere else that the those battles fought um, is visible on the surface in the, well, so the rest of your site there? I have heard that there. Yeah, I, I, I walk the coast huh? from here to here and it doesn't exist, okay? So I, I'll accept that. No, it doesn't exist there. I mean, as far as I can see. Um, but certainly, if you look at some surface stuff, I mean, wells drilled and stuff, yeah, they seem to have encountered something there. So, the fact that it doesn't seem seen on there. No. The only other place I've seen significant lateral movement like that is um, in Piparo, yeah. near the volcano. And there I have seen bathrooms leaving bedrooms. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was quite interesting because the owner tried to keep patching the crack in the wall. <laughs> you could actually see how many layers of tiles there were as his bathroom kept going away from the bedrooms. <laughs> Not many experiments like that that you have in luxury. Okay, 
So, so you know, part of the history here, I, I give you this as a reference because what I'm going to do now is to make you jump straight from there to what's happening in the rocks in the northern range. And remember, we've said that these have traveled, we think, relative to those a lot more. So you'd expect those rocks to be busted up and to show signs of, you know, much more, much more movement than the ones in the south. And that's indeed the case. If you go and you look at the limestones at, that we have throughout, um, well, the limestones that are quarried throughout the, the, the um, Lamantine area, these are calcite veins. And, and this just shows that the rock has been broken and fragmented by that movement, intensely so. And they have been heated. We know that from the changes in the minerals that occur. And that's why they take such a beautiful polish if you want to take the time to do it. Okay? As does the blue stones of the Northern Range, which you could never get a polish like that on any of the limestones of Central Trinidad. So the heat, because of frictional forces and burial, have caused these rocks to be very, very different than anything you see in the South. The, um, the Melau gravel, all those quartz veins, tell us that those rocks have been to three, four, five hundred degrees centigrade, which is about the maximum your oven can possibly go to before it melts. Um, and that's, we know that because we, we, we think we know that, because John just know everything. Um, and these rocks have had a similar history. They've been buried a long way, and they show lots of evidence of having been cracked and busted because they have traveled relative to each other a lot. This is an outcrop near Toku, and I hope you can see, even though the quality of the reproduction is not good, that these rocks are bent vertically. Yeah, you can see the rocks snaking like this. My foot's on one that's going up like this. And that's caused by rocks just literally ripping past each other and being bent and twisted by the forces that have moved them a thousand kilometers. Okay? You don't see that in South Korea. So everything about North Trinidad tells us there was possibly a long journey. It doesn't mean that there isn't any journey in South Trinidad. That journey has begun. Bits of South Trinidad are now looking like they're trying to join this bit on the journey and they're going to flake off and take off to the east at possibly the same high rate as the east is going, as the north is going. Okay? So that's, that's an interesting development. Oh, 30 minutes? 40? Too much? Okay. And some of that movement manifests itself in places like Piparo, where you get mud volcanoes coming to the surface. Because again, as the movement occurs deep down, it's squeezing the mud in the only way they can find their way out of that squeeze. But like if you jump on a tube of toothpaste, something's going to come out the end. Not with, I can't tell you which end, but it's going to come out the end, right? And that's kind of what the Earth is doing. But I think when you go to the very south of Trinidad and you have the luxury of having the time to walk around the Trinity Hills down here to get you a point, which this is a picture of. This is a flare from the, uh, from the BP complex. These rocks are two million years old. And I have to say that when I first had the opportunity to see them, and I, came, I graduated from Scotland where Trinidad in time was so insignificant that they never told us about things that happened after the Jurassic. So Trinidad didn't exist on their time scale. I came here and I saw rocks that were two and a half million years old that were already bent and twisted and sticking up in the air at 50 degrees of angle. You can't do that without moving things a lot. The south of Trinidad is moving up at phenomenal rates. Phenomenal rates. The only thing that's preventing you from having the Himalayas, where the Trinity Hills are, is the rate of erosion. The rocks are so soft, and we have so much rainfall, that they are being redeposited, they're, being, they're making our beaches, of Mayaro, all those places. Thank you very much. These rocks are moving very, very good. Next. Okay. How's that for timing? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.